Um, so as Sophie said, I work on chalk streams. I often go to very hidden sites like the one in this photo. This was part of our open chalk streams events. But lots of locals take me on walks around the public paths to show me where they can see the rivers and talk about some projects. So that's that's how I know these areas. And the things to consider when you're going on these walks, I would say, is take a hat that has a brim that helps you to see into the streams and see the wildlife a bit more clearly because you're shading your eyes from the sun. If you have a pair of polarizing sunglasses, they're really useful for looking in the streams themselves. You don't have to go out and buy them, but if you do have them, remember to take them with you. Obviously, things like binoculars are useful. I, I don't take them with me because I look at things quite close up. I look at like looking at insects. But if you like looking at vistas and things in the distance, maybe take binoculars. And the paths are then they're, they're not like tarmac roads, but they are footpaths maintained by Gemma and her team. But remember that you're in the countryside, and I would strongly recommend closed-toed sandals or walking shoes, not flip-flops, that kind of thing. So this is the blue line that covers our scheme area. This is Andover. This is to put it into context. That's Andover, that's Winchester, and that's Basingstoke. So I'm going to talk about one on the Pill Hill Brook, one in Andover itself. Andover is really good for seeing the river, I think. One's on the Bourne Rivulet, which is this stream. Uh, one's on the Upper Test, and one is down in Alsford. Now, I did have one in Cheriton and Candover, but I didn't know a bit of the walk, and I didn't want to send people on there. So we'll talk a little bit about how you can find out footpaths and places to walk. But these are the ones I've chosen. Um, and I've put to the right, look up the definitive map of Hampshire. So I'm gonna show you what that is on the next slide. I use this a lot if I want to look up footpaths. Um, so if we click onto the next slide, you can put in the area that you want. Now it doesn't always take you straight there, but it'll take you to a big map that looks all full of pink spaghetti like this and you can zoom in on it and then it'll take you to a map that has loads of footpaths so we'll see those in later in my talk you'll then also get a whole load of um things that you can toggle on and off so you can take off long distance routes or you can take off cycle routes and all sorts of things so that it's a bit cleaner for you to look at so i'd strongly recommend if you're really interested in footpaths and walking this is a really good tool so big question i'm afraid is are the streams really visible so lots and lots of our streams are not visible to the public they're privately owned they are basically running through people's gardens if you like uh, when i talk through the maps i'll tell you where you can see them um, some of them are much more visible than others you do have to be aware of that when you're trying to see these chalk streams so let's go to route number one. So this is the one on the Pill Hill Brook, which is near Andover. Um, so it's about two kilometers long. So it's not a very long walk, but I chose this one because I think it's quite varied. On the next slide, I give you um, the details of where you can park. So all my, all my details that are uh, like a grid reference and a walk three words location finder are for the car parking space, which is shown by a purple sort of uh, circle here. So you'll uh, be taken to this car parking space, which is near Amport. And they're really lucky because they've got um, what is called Amport Fen. So the little um, walk that I would suggest is a nice one, is you park there and you walk along this uh, grassy playground. And as you walk there on the other side, there is really, really pretty, proper little Hampshire chocolate box thatched cottages. They're so sweet. They must have lots of people take pictures of them. They're so pretty. And then you have a choice. You can either start walking up um, around the back of the Pale Hill Brook, or you can walk through the Fen, which is a bit I really like, which is why I've chosen it. Um, so there's a little bit of a walking on the road here. It is quiet, but some of the cars do come around quite quickly. And a lot of these villages have lots of um, 
van deliveries. So most of the things that are driving around quite quickly are big white vans. So just be aware when you're walking along here. But then you'll come to um, a little gate and a sign saying Amport Fen. And you can walk through the Fen. Now, it's owned by the parish council, so it is open to the public, but it is not a maintained footpath. So after one winter, there was a log lying, a tree had fallen down and they left the log there. So for people with push chairs, um, it might, for instance, it might be a bit tricky. You might find there's something, you know, in, in your way. It's largely left for nature, which is why I particularly like it. But um, the volunteers do go out and try and remove everything um, so that it is accessible. So it should be open and free to walk around. And you basically walk along here. So the stream is running down this way. And at the end of the walk, before you make then a loop, there are some heritage features. Um, there are some old sort of sluice gates and things. Um, and it's a bit of wet woodland. That's why it's interesting. And there's lots of interesting birds flying around. Um, so there's lots of wildlife. And then you walk back and I would walk back, keeping the trees to your left and the field to your right. If it's particularly high, a time of high water, like in the winter, you might have to work, walk further into the sort of playground area because it does get boggy around here. But this time of year, it's probably quite a nice walk. Um, and then you come to this point on the map. Now, when I was taken on this foot, this walk with the local person, I actually thought I was walking into somebody's, it does feel like you're walking up to somebody's house and going around their back garden, but there's a little driveway here. You walk up to the very final house of these few that are at the bottom here, and then you'll see the little um, Hampshire footpath sign. And that will take you up on the longest part of the footpath. Now, unfortunately, you can't see into the stream here. It's very well screened. The owners are keeping it private. There might be some points when you can look down. You're looking down a slope into the brook. Keep walking along to the end. And then you have a choice. You can either turn right on a much longer walk. But I would say turn left and follow this path down. It takes you over the stream. It's like a little ford that's now got a foot footway over it. It's really sweet. It's nice and shaded. If it's a very hot day, it's a place where you can get some shade. Um, and then you can turn right on the road again for probably 10 steps. And then you come to a green open space and this belongs to the pub, which you can see is, has got a sign there at the top. Um, you're free to walk in here. You can then get really close up to the stream, which is at the end of the grass here. Um, locals probably paddle in there. If you have a dog with you, get a drink there. I don't believe there are any waterfalls, so you won't be disturbing any wildlife. Um, and then you can walk back around. Now, you can walk back the way you came, or you could walk along this main roadway here. It's safe, um, but there's the occasional car driving by. So you could do that. You have a choice then to get back to your car. This is the same place. This is with all the grid reference details to take you to that car park point. And this is one of these uh, definitive maps. So on this, you can see where the footpaths go into the countryside and you can choose if you think well that's not very long I'd like a longer one you can choose a, a footpath if you're confident to go off into the countryside and you can see there's no actual footpath here this is that little fen I was talking about because it's owned by the parish council man managed by the parish council and you will be taking this pink walk down to this uh, green dotted one and then round into again a piece of private land that's owned by the pub um, you'll be walking in the sloping downs. Um, so this footpath at the back, the pink one, is up on a bit of a hill. It's not one that will be difficult. To, it's not a sloping big hill. You'll, you'll go up um, probably one contour line, and then you'll be following it flat to then come down. But you'll see the um, Hampshire hills around you. Um, and it's a very pretty village and so is Monkston with really traditional thatched cottages. The wildlife you'll see, it will be mainly, I'd say, in the fen area and it will be largely birdsong. 
So this is around Anton Lakes, and this is in Andover. Now, Andover, I, I had to choose one. I, I like Andover for the accessibility of the river. You can walk pretty much right through Andover and be close to the river and see it. It's not always the prettiest, but you can see the water. When you come to this part, which I will talk more about on the next page, you can see there's a little feeder stream. This is a Winterbourne. It's a very long Winterbourne, and it's one of the few places that if you want to get up really close to one and see all the gravels and things that are called, um, it's where the water's coming up out of uh, under real pressure. There's some of those around here. There's lots of little springs. It's quite gravelly. It's really pretty. And I, I think it's really special, but I quite like wild places. But then you've got a nice proper footpath walk. So if you've got somebody who's a bit more unsteady on their feet, it's a really good walk around the lakes. So getting there, uh, all the details are here in the little box. That will take you to the purple spot that's at Anton Lakes. I would say driving round the Charlton roundabout, it's got trees on either side. It's not a very, it's not one of these open um, roundabouts. It's you, you're driving around, it all just looks quite tree lined. Once you go past this Gough Way turning, just stay in the left hand lane, go really slowly. You go down a bit of a slope and you see a little tiny wooden sign saying Anton Lakes. It's quite hidden, um, but you drive down the end of the little drive and it's a dead end drive just for people who want to park and go for walks. And there's always loads of parking there. Um, so you've got a choice when you park here. You can go clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, it's about one and a half kilometres long. It's mostly flattish because it was the old water meadows. It's very level and it's well, it's Tess Valley Borough Council footpath. So it's a nicely gravelly footpath. Um, and you're basically walking around in a big circle. Now I've put confusing here because it's a countryside walk. It might not say um, Anton Lakes path, but you basically you have to take that left turn and keep the lake on your left if you're going around and it will take you around. This is the bit where I said you can get up close and see the springs and it will take you around back to the car park. At some times of the year, there will be algal blooms um, and the lakes don't look very scenic to um, visitors. Um, this is unfortunately a feature of ponding areas on chalk streams and there's lots of water coming in from a couple of other fishing lakes. So you can see on this picture, they've got some green, green stuff growing in the lakes. Um, and Tess Valley Borough Council do a lot of work to try and remove this, but this is what happens when water gets warm. So um, if you're taking a dog and you see that, I'd say don't let them run in, get into the water. There's also a little playground here. Now, again, there are no toilets and there's nowhere to buy any sort of refreshments or anything, but you're just a stop away from um, Andover Town Centre where there's absolutely everything you need. So the next one is in St Marybourne. This is on the Bourne Rivulet, and this is about 1.8 kilometres long. The um, details in the box to the right will take you to a little tiny public car park that is um, next to a community shop and the parish hall and some free public toilets with wash, hand washing facilities as well. So it's a really handy place. If you've got um, dogs or children with you, there's a big grassy space here for them to run around and burn off some energy before you go for your walk. The footpath takes you, when you get out of your car, you'll be facing a huge flat playground and you will walk to your left of that playground and there's a tree-lined route around St Marybourne Lake, which is this blue blob on the screen. You can't actually get up to it, it's fenced off, and so you won't be able to get to the lake itself, but you can walk around it. And especially when the lime trees are flowering, 
it's really really heavily scented with lime trees and they've got some interest if you're into trees they've got some um, interesting trees on this walk where my cursor is going um, because they have had memorial trees planted all around so there's a really interesting mix of different things to look at but you basically be walking keeping this lake to your left as you walk around then you come to an, a junction it's very very clear there's a path keeping the lake to your left a lot of locals walk up a little bit further away and down because they're walking their dogs but my suggestion would be to keep the lake to your left so that you can see all these pretty trees now then you've got a choice you can turn left and if you walk a very short distance you you can actually see over into the stream on either side and at this time of year there is lots of water in there um, and the plants are all growing really high so you can have a little peek in there um, and then you can go back the way you came and walk up a slight slope and then you'll see a little footpath sign to your left now it does look like it's going into the middle of the sort of jungly vegetation but that is where it goes and so you take that left turn um, off the proper road because this is a little private road this one with the orange dots is a private road metalled road that goes up to a, a big house at the end so you're on the right route if you're on that metal road turn off to the footpath and there's a little cottage just on the side so if you miss your turning which will be into the um uh, old water meadows you will have gone past that cottage so you need to go back and find that little footpath sign um, and then you'll be walking across what were old water meadows and it's full of really long rushes if it's a bit breezy it's a lovely rustly sound it's full of ducks and you'll hear if you go now <laughs> you'll hear lots of little dabbling sounds because the ducks and their ducklings are all eating little snails and things in the vegetation so it's really sweet now um, and the water's high and then you come to a bit where you can actually see into the stream again there's a bridge and then you come out and you'll be by the Bourne Valley Inn pub and they have a little garden grassy garden area with some huts and things you're perfectly entitled to walk in there and you can actually get to see one of the little drainage channels as well don't walk back along this main road. It is, there is no footpath and the cars go really, really fast along there. Go back the way you came to where I said you can peek in. And if you want to walk past the cottages, there's not an actual um, pavement, but it's much slower and there's lots and lots of cars parked there. So people have to go drive slowly. So on the right, it looks very dry. This was last year when we had that terrible drought. Um, but this is looking across at the stream at that point where I said you can look either way. And this is looking downstream where the river runs away. Now it is absolutely thick with vegetation and plants. And I think the next picture. Yeah, this is what it looks like now. This was about three weeks ago. Um, so you would be walking across in this sort of vegetation. But don't worry, there is a proper path. So <laughs> um, but it's very tall and rustly around you. And this is upon the other side but this was last year when it was really dry so it's not the best picture but you, you it's worth going up to have a look um, because the stream runs next to the pond um, so that's the St Marybourne walk so this one actually is online as one of Gemma's uh, Hampshire countryside service walks so she'll probably talk a little bit about where you can get hold of this walk it's about 2.2 kilometres. I've put these pictures up because it's to show you it'd be it's a big open field. Of course, all of these walks will look very different depending on which time of the year you go, because this was in April or May, because I go and work in here with my volunteer groups. And it is now probably waist height with flowering plants. Um, and there's lots of insects using the flowering plants. So uh, information about the car park takes you to an allotment car park near what I call the fish gate entrance to the Millennium uh, Green Meadow. So it's a big gate, metal gate with a metal fish on it. 
and you open that gate and then you're walking into the picture at the top, basically. Um, and my recommendation would be to walk, keeping the tree tree line to your left. Um, and then you walk over a gravelly path. You can take that path, but I find it really interesting that even the local people don't know that there's a little boardwalk at the back here that takes you a bit further round. Um, basically, you then walk down towards one of the little um, spring fed streams. If you've got dogs with you, it's probably nicest to the wildlife that's used in that space to keep it on the lead if you want to let them into the water because it's one of the only places that's got lots of water voles. You can get in there, people do go in and um, let their dogs in, but they get dis the water voles get disturbed a lot. So if you're going to be kind to wildlife, you can do that, but it's obviously up to you what you're doing on the day. Um, and I'll tell you where there's another more official dog dip that you can use um, as you're going around the walk. Um, so this is like this is what you'll see. You'll see the trees on your left and you walk to the end um, and then you'll come around to the little stream. And then from there, there's a little wooden bridge. Uh, it's very shaded and it will take you to a sort of a bit of a junction. So you can either go straight ahead or right. So the right way would take you down what's called the weir. It's a, it's a road. Um, but if you go left, um, you'll see the signs to the fulling mill and it's well signposted the walk at the back of the fulling mill. And from here, you can really see fantastic views of the river. You can't get to it, it's fenced off for wildlife, um, but you can see and hear and watch animals. And the water voles, we've seen them swimming around here as well. And at the end, there's a bit of a, a dog leg and this is where there's the official dog dip. Um, and it's properly been made uh, with advice from the Environment Agency and your dog can get into the water there. This is then a main road, a busy road. You need to use a footpath. And you can walk along to the middle of Whitchurch um, and then take the Whit uh, Winchester Street footpath back. You'll be going past the silk mill here and again, you can look into the water and see some absolutely enormous fish because they're used to being fed um, and they probably were stocked. They are huge. So if you like looking at big fish, you'll be in heaven there. Um, and you can see the historic uh, silk mill. Depending on the day, there's toilets in the Jill Nethercott Centre. And I think there are also toilets around the back here. There's some public toilets in, I think it's Bell Street. And then you make your way back and a really nice walk. You can either go straight back to your car or if you wanted to extend the walk a little bit, there's another bit of a walk along the weir. It's very quiet um, and you can go back. So this is the bit I was saying where if you keep your dog on a lead, it's really kind because it's really thick, lush vegetation that particularly suits waterfalls. Um, and if you're extremely quiet, and you've crept up to this area, you might be lucky and see them. We've seen them. Sophie had them nearly right by her foot when we were there once. Um, if, you, if you're taking a snack with you or something, you can sit and eat it there and just see if something pops out. When I said at the very start, walk down and keep the trees to your left, you come to a bit that's really jungly and has these very tall plants. And people often say, oh, is that gunnera? Or is it rhubarb or something or is it an invasive plant it's not it's a native plant and depending on the time of year you go it looks different so right now it looks like some alien gigantic plant it's called butterbur and in the springtime if you went in the spring there'd be small probably about 15 centimeter pink flower spikes so if you're going in the summer or the spring summer and autumn you'll see these huge leaves and you can walk between them and then go around the back. It's quite interesting to see them. They, they're, they're doing particularly well there. And this is just a couple of my um, volunteers because we go there a lot and pull out Himalayan balsam. Um, so if you go on any of these walks and you see anything that looks like an alien plant, just drop us a line because we're always interested and we go and pull it out. So another one in the sort of Whitchurch area in Overton. So this is a bit further towards Basingstoke Way. And this is called flashits. 
And this is one of the only places that people in Overton can get to the stream. To get there, there's a little car park, a London Road car park. It's not big, but there always seems to be spaces there. And there's also lots of places along uh, High Street and also along Station Road you can park. Um, so basically park there, carefully walk across, uh, across London Road. There are proper um, pedestrian crossings because it's a proper busy road. Walk along Station Road, which is just a normal road, I'm afraid, with a pavement. And then you get to a really tiny little mill called Quidhampton Mill. Um, it's It looks like it's dropped down into the landscape because it's the ground was much uh, lower there. On your left, you'll see what I call a countryside wooden fence, uh, not like a garden fence. And you can turn in there and it's a gravelly path. And it's really lovely because if I do say so, we did some really amazing work there putting in some um, restoration features and you can get down to the water um, in some gravelly areas and there's a little bench you can sit on and there's loads of wildlife that you can hear along here. Um, nut hatches, you often hear nut hatches. Um, they do get kingfishers there um, and it's a little walk um, that then leads into some wet woodland. So it's not so visible at the back there, but it's worth it just for this beginning bit. Uh, but you can walk around and do a circular loop back. It's, it's really pretty there, also very shaded. So if it's a really hot day, this is a particularly nice walk, but it's not very long. Um, but this is what, what we did. So now it looks a lot more pretty. This was when we first did the work so you can see we've put some shingly areas put in some logs and branches they've all been pinned in place so they won't move and it makes the water move round in a really interesting way for wildlife and invertebrates and at this time of the year it should look particularly pretty because all the plants have all grown up around it and there are little fish using this space now because they've been attracted by the flow. So you do see some lovely wildlife there and you can walk right up to it. Um, and if you are a local person, you know that people go um, and take children with little nets and uh, actually get really up close and personal with a chalk stream. So it's a lovely space. My final one, I believe this is my final one, is the River Arl. So this, again, was one of our projects, so um, I know it really well. You can see on the left hand side, we've improved the footpath. Um, it was being eroded by uh, dog claws when they get in and out of the water um, and also from footfall. So it was in places impassable in the winter. Um, so we've uh, regraded that and we've um, put in some uh, river restoration work that allows the vegetation to grow um, so that it's a better place for wildlife that people can still see in. So this is the same place. You can just see one of the posts there. This is the same view, but taken you know, from slightly from the left. So you can see how well the vegetation has grown up. You can still see into the river, but it is a particularly pretty place and it's good for wildlife. So I think the next one, yeah, this is the footpath and the walk. So the walk itself is only one and a half kilometres and the um, directions take you to what I refer to as the ARC, which is the uh, Alsford Rugby Club, Rugby and Football Club. There's a big car park there and it's free for two hours. So you can park your car there. There are also public toilets. If you go into the ARC, you're entitled to do that and you go up the stairs and there's toilets upstairs. And when, once you park your car, go to the very left of the car park and you'll see there's a straight walk between some trees and a fence line. And then you come to the end of the big sloping green field. Walk right in the middle down the slope and you'll come to a fence line. It's quite obvious where the um, gate is or the sort of, uh, yeah, it is a gate into the footpath. Now this then takes you down towards our path that we worked on. And it is quite a steep walk. It's, it's obviously well used, but um, I basically wouldn't want to 
push a wheelchair down that slope. So um, just bear that in mind. It is not such you're on, you're on a high piece of ground here and then it slopes down to the river. So you need to bear that in mind. Um, you're basically walking along a footpath and you can look into the river to your right. Things to look out for are you can see all the different types of weeds moving in the river. You'll see loads of birds using the water, kingfishers again, swans, um, dabbling ducks. You can see fish. You can see there's a resident pike you might spot. They've got grayling using this piece of the river, which have got beautiful um, red dorsal fins. They've got brown trout, native brown trout using it. And I've seen brook lampreys in here on two occasions. So if you really look at the river as you're walking by, you'll you'll see into it and you can see uh, lots of wildlife. Um, there's also loud chetties warblers. I always hear them. Um, and again, kingfishers. And most of these walks do have kingfishers. And then you'll come to the eel house, which is a heritage feature. Um, they have open days. So if you time it right, you might be able to get in on an open day. But basically, when you get to the eel house, you can turn back and come back the way you came. Now, there is a much longer walk, um, but I'm not talking about that one here, but there, all these walks have extensions on them if you look at, at that um, a definitive map. But I would then say walk back the way you came and come back to your car. Um, top tip on people who like looking for kingfishers, because a lot of people say to me when we see them, oh, I've never seen one before and I didn't know anything about them is if you download the uh, song of a kingfisher or you listen on Google, it's got a high pitched peeping sound. If you hear that, they're often starting to fly. Um, and then I would look away downstream from when you hit where you hear it. And then they're most likely flying away from you and then you'll get a glimpse of them. And they fly about a meter and a half, two meters above the water. They fly really low down to the water. Don't look up in the air, you'll miss them. Look at the water and they scooch on down the river. OK, so, um, yeah, I'm here to talk about rights of way and how you're to access the countryside safely and leave it enjoyable for other people to use as well. Um, I'm a community engagement ranger, so I work with the access teams who specifically work on the rights of way. Um, and we engage with members of the public like yourselves, landowners and parish councils promoting the countryside code and rights of way. And I also run volunteer tasks on our rights of way network, basically trying to make things safer and better for people to access their countryside. So that includes ditch crossings, vegetation, etc. As you can imagine, we've got a lot of vegetation clearance going on right now because everything is very overgrown. I also do a bit of outreach. So we get military veterans come out and uh, do projects with us and uh, I go to schools, etc. to try and engage everyone with what we're up to. I am going to do a bit of a shameless plug. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel, which there are some really good videos on about dogs clearing up after your dog, livestock, etc., which I'm going to touch on shortly. And they're videos that I've produced to make, make it clearer to people how we can be behaving correctly with our animals outside. Um, so we'll talk about quickly what a right of way is. Some of you may or may or not know, but literally it means the right to pass and repass. That's literally what it means. And we have footpaths, which are signalled by a yellow arrow, and that means pedestrians only. We've got bridleways, which is a blue arrow, and that's pedestrians, cyclists and horse riders. And then we've got something called a restricted byway, which is like a burgundy purple colour. And that includes horses and carriages and that, so no motorised vehicles. And then finally, we've got a byway open to all traffic, which we call boats. And that does include your four by fours and motorbikes. So they're your different classes of right and way that you're going to find in the countryside. So when Maggie was talking about the pink squiggly lines, they're all footpaths on our definitive map. Um, annoyingly, they're not colour coded like this on the definitive map or the OS maps. They are a bit different. But to help you get around and not get lost, you've got those signs to look out for. You've also got finger posts, which is like what you see on the left hand side there. And obviously the OS map, I really rate the OS map. If you like a paper copy, absolutely go ahead. There's paper copies for every single uh, county going, but I love the OS map on my phone. 
because it's linked to your GPS, you know exactly where you are. There is no way of getting lost because you've got an actual live arrow location of where you're stood. It's really cheap to get the complete package on OS. I think it's something like £30 annual fee, which I think is a bargain. We're all here because we like to enjoy the countryside. So I think you definitely get your money's worth. But obviously the definitive map, like Maggie was speaking about on our county council website, that is also another way of finding out where you're at and planning your routes properly. How to behave on a right of way. So I'm just going to briefly go through some of the common problems that we find. And I'm sure Maggie and Sophie will agree with some of these as well. Dogs on lead. So the countryside code states that your dog should be in effective control. So effective control is the owner's prerogative. So if you've got an amazingly behaved dog who will come when you call its name and ignore every distraction going and be at your side instantly, amazing and I'm very jealous and you need to tell me how you got to that stage of your dog and um, that is a dream but I think I'm speaking for many people when your dog may not be that well behaved and a lead is the way forward now you, you see these are my friends on the left hand side we go out running with our dogs and in this occasion we're going through Herb Forest and they're all on a lead it's the best way of making sure your dog is behaving. Um, as Maggie touched upon, it's not great if they're dashing off into rivers left, right and centre because they could be disturbing really sensitive wildlife. There are a lot of official doggy dips now in a lot of places, so keep your eyes open for that. It also prevents bank erosion. We do get a lot of problems on our footpaths of dogs diving in and out the same areas over and over again, and it starts to erode the bank. Um, and that is quite a costly problem to solve. So please be mindful of where you're dogs are going in and out while we're talking about going in and out of water it's also really important to bear in mind if you've put flea treatment on the back of your dog's neck recently the chemicals on that neck will be around 24 to 48 hours after you've popped it on so you don't really want your dog going in water when it's just had flea treatment on that could definitely cause an environmental problem locally so it's just worth bearing in mind in the middle, you see a lovely example of a footpath sign. Now, it's really important to stick to rights of way when you're out and about. And I know how tempting it is. You're going through the forest or you're going past one of those streams Mackie just spoke to you about. And you just want to get a bit closer. Or if I can just get past that hedgerow and, and go in and have a little closer look. But if you're leaving the footpath, if you're leaving the right of way, under the countryside code, you are trespassing. Legally, you are trespassing. And these areas that we are walking on, we have got to remember they are owned by people. So the footpaths and bridleways you're using, either side of that right of way is a landowner, is a farmer. It might be, it might be the Wildlife Trust, it might be Forestry Commission, it might be Hampshire County Council, but someone owns the land you're walking over. So if you leave the right of way, unless there's a sign saying you can, well, you, you really shouldn't be. Um, another reason why effective control with your dog is so good, because if they start tearing off around the woods, they are effectively trespassing too. So it's it's really important to bear that in mind. Top right, poo bags, poo, dog poo. Oh my goodness, it's the bane of our life. There is just no excuse for it anymore. There are so many poo bins around. There are so many methods of picking your poo up and, you know, the dicky bags or putting it in a tub to put in your backpack or whatever. But leaving dog feces around is, is really environmentally damaging. It also contains a lot of bacteria. So if children are picking or, or sitting on the grass having a picnic or anything like that, and they accidentally come into contact with dog feces and don't realise there could be a lot of medical problems going on there if they ingest it. Even if there's been a rain shower, that means the poo has actually just gone through the grass a little bit more and has spread. So we really must be picking up after our dogs and not leaving the bags hanging in bushes, which I'm sure all of you see and all of you get incredibly frustrated about because there is no such thing as a poo fairy. We've got to be taking responsibility. And I think it's um, just a really valid thing to be reminding your friends and family about it. If you know someone who's a prime suspect in all of this, just politely informing them of the reasons why we do need to be picking up after our dogs and we need to be taking that poo bin into a bin. It's very important, I think, to talk about livestock. So bottom right picture, that was taken when we were putting in some gates in a cattle field. And cattle are really, really curious. Curious enough that I nearly lost my wing mirror in that photo minutes after I took that. Um, and I had to go and chase them off because they were itching along the wing mirror and I thought it was going to snap off the van. And I don't think my boss would be very happy. It's really important if you've planned a walk 
or if you haven't planned it and you're not expecting it and you come up to some animals in a field. I personally am lucky I've never had a bad experience with this, but I do know people who have been chased, usually as cows, out of a field. Now, there are things you can do to make this situation better. Have a look in the field festival. Can you see any young? If you're going to see young animals in that field, the parents are going to be more flighty. So with the sheep, for instance, they're probably going to be more flighty than usual. Sheep don't tend to cause an issue. Horses and cows, though, are very protective over their young and they won't be flighty. They will stand their ground, especially if you've got a dog with you. Obviously, that is a predator and they are a prey animal and they will instantly be more more aggressive maybe than normal. So have a look in the field. Can I see young animals? Yes, I can. OK, how far are they away from me now? If they're all loitering around the gate, I wouldn't even go there. I wouldn't even try and open the gate if there's a whole whole herd of cows stood there. I don't think it's worth the risk. I personally would probably turn back and find another route. If they're all the way on the other side of the field, then let's enter the field. Let's not loiter, though. Let's not stop, take pictures, uh, stop to you know faff around. Let's just walk from A to B. If you start running or waving your hands in the air and, and shouting and using your voice loudly, um, that will attract curious animals and that will attract cows, definitely. And um, they will come and say, gosh, what's this fun game going on in my field? This is amazing. Let me join in. So with cows, you've just got to stay calm and walk from A to B in a nice, sensible manner, not making too much noise as you're doing it. So it's really worth actually mentioning that to children if you're about to enter a field. With horses, they're much more skitty. They, they run rings around you. I've had a horse run rings around me before. The, the key is don't stare at them. Keep going. Just keep going. If you start staring at them, that's, again, they're going to be feeling quite threatened about that. They're a prey animal and humans are a predator. So look at the field. Take note of what's in it. Is there any young? Or is there any animals that look particularly elderly? This all will matter because it might depend on if they're going to be a bit spooked by you or not. If you don't feel happy and you feel a bit nervous, don't do it to yourself. Don't stress yourself out. Don't stress the animals in the field out. And if you've got a dog who's stressed already and barking at them, it's not worth it. Um, and another crucial thing, going back to effective control with your doggies, I think with, with a livestock field, even if you've got the most super duper behaved dog, I think for safety reasons, you've got to consider the animals in the field and a lead would be advisable. The important thing to add is, if you are being chased by animals, to let your dog off the lead. So the key thing is here, it's usually the dog that's wound them up. If you let your dog off the lead, your dog 99.9% .9 of the time will find its way out that field much quicker than you. So let your dog off, your dog will find a way out and then you get out of there. So that is the crucial thing and that's what landowners would be advising you to do. Um, another part, of my job is to make the countryside more accessible. So as Maggie did touch upon, there are parts of some parts which are just incredibly difficult just because of the environment that we're working in. So we have got to remember we are talking about the countryside and the countryside hasn't been made for everybody. We are doing our best to make it available to everybody. So we have something called design standards within the countryside access team. And these are standards that we try and adhere to as long as the environment surrounding it is applicable to it. So at the moment, we are putting in six sleeper wide bridges, as you can see on the left hand side with a double handrail. So six sleeper wide should ensure that someone with a tramper, for instance, or if they've got a buggy, et cetera, that these people can access that bridge safely. Double handrail is obviously to ensure ch children stay on the bridge. And obviously at the end of that, you see there's a pedestrian gate. So pedestrian gate, simple latch, open and close job. On the right, you will see something called a radar gate. These are a kissing gate. Kissing gates are a bit different to pedestrian gates for those of you who are interested. Kissing gates are, tend to be used with livestock, especially sheep. Sheep are escape artists and can seem to squeeze out the smallest of holes. So livestock proof gates tend to go with the, the kissing gate. So basically, if that door didn't swing shut for some reason, the cage still entraps the, the animal. The difference with a radar gate, this has actually got a key that disabled users can use to swing the gate out completely so they can drive a tramper through. So those keys are what you might use, for instance, in disabled toilets, for example. You know, contact your local borough council. They should have some in stock to give out to you. What's very important to tell you about gates is it is what the landowner wants. 
gates are owned by a landowner and so are styles so we can't force upon a landowner to change all their styles to gates it has to be the landowner agreeing to it because they need it and they are the ones going to be looking after and maintaining it if they don't want a large gate and they want a small gate we really do have to go with them we will do our best to discuss and persuade but at the end of the day it's their call so I think that's really important to bear in mind and we do our best with landowners to promote the larger gate, the larger, the better in our eyes. Because when we say disabled, we don't necessarily mean physically. We also sometimes mean visually impaired people, people who are amputees or with severe arthritis. They all come under the category of people who may need a gate of some description. With ditch crossings, we are in charge of those because that is on the right of way. That is on the footpath that you are following. So it's down to us as a county council to ensure they are safe and secure for use. Maggie touched on it briefly. This is our definitive map. Now, if you spot a problem on a right of way, we would love to hear about it. Well, I say love, that might be the wrong term, but we need to hear about it because we don't have many people in our team. And my volunteers, for instance, and members of the public are our eyes and ears because we wouldn't know half of what's going on out there if it wasn't for you guys telling us. So this is where you can come to log a problem on a right of way. So if you type into Google search Hampshire County Council problem with a right of way, something like that, it will bring you to this page. Easy to make a, an account on here. If you make an account, you can go in again and again. And we ask for you to be specific with the location. Please make sure you know exactly where that problem is. We do have problems sometimes where problems haven't been recorded in the right place and our ranger or a volunteer will be out there traipsing up and down. They can't find a thing. So do make sure you know exactly where you are. Take photos. Photos are so important for us to actually see what the problem is. Um, and then you can unlock it and it will go to the correct member of staff to deal with. So when we're talking about problems, they range from vegetation that's blocking a right of way. Maybe a bit of signage has fallen down. Someone's reversed into it or something. That's quite common. Maybe it's a handrail on a bridge that's wobbly or fallen over. Or maybe it's something to do with a nuisance animal. So we do get that sometimes if we've got problems with a landowner's dogs who are running around a field, intimidating people. We get the odd problems sometimes come through with horses who are a little bit antisocial. So the whole there's, there's a whole array of things that you could report. But it is really important that you guys know where to go when it comes to rights of way and, and reporting an issue. We obviously do our very best to um, solve them. Some are easily resolvable, some are not. So we do ask for your patience with it. But you will get updates once your problem has been opened and hopefully once your problem has been resolved. So you personally do get an update via email. And a, li a little image of, of my volunteers at work. I think it's really important everyone knows who does all the work or most of the work on the rights of way. And don't get me wrong, my, my ranger colleagues do a lot and they do an incredible job. But I want to get as many people out there as possible on the rights of way experiencing what it's like. So top left, we've got some volunteers helping us put a pedestrian gate in. Uh, top right, we've got handrail going up. That's Hurst on Tarrant. Again, some lovely local places to Andover that we've been speaking about. Bottom right is a lovely ditch crossing and on the left, a very happy uh, work party. As you can see, people have great fun with me. What can I say? But guys, seriously, uh, if you know, if you want to get involved, I appreciate you are um, volunteering a lot with these guys. But if you ever fancy coming out and seeing what Rights of Way Volunteer Work is all about, more than happy for you to have my email. We do a lot of, lot of hands-on jobs and it's really, really satisfying at the end. But when a gate appears um, next time, you know it's not a gate fairy, it's one of us who's put that in. And usually it's quite a lot of hard work and a lot of digging, but it's it's very much worthwhile. So um, that's just a little uh, imagery of, of what we do and how we help the rights of way with volunteers. But yeah, again, please email me um, if you want any more information and all of those sites that I've just spoken about are really easily found on Google. <laughs>